Hey there, School of Tomorrow students. If you're new to this channel, it coasts around sort of like a high school level subject. So in this case, a la Saturday Academy pilot test courses, I'm showing off the capabilities of Jupyter Notebooks. Now you as a math teacher, perhaps you've used Sage in the past, or you've used Mathematica, which IPython somewhat uh, emulates in terms of the look and feel, uh, then this won't be all that new to you to see anything like this. It's pretty much plain vanilla. And what I'm doing is sort of doing like the outline or skeleton of what might pass for a scientific or STEM related topic on a Jupyter Notebook. And I'm, you could say I'm mocking it up. I'm giving the idea. And of course, because of this being what it is, this channel and my interests, I pick some obvious links and also topical uh, around this time is the uh, what I mistakenly called COVID-19. That's the disease, but the virus they're calling COVID SARS or sorry SARS-CoV-2. They don't like to use that as much in the media sometimes because people don't like the sound of SARS, but that just refers to how you experience it if, if you know, if you get it like that. So anyway, back in the old days here in like 91, I'm talking about uh, Bucky Fuller and how his stuff kind of integrates with some of our current thinking regarding, say, sphere packing, um, matrices and lattices, and it's all very sort of, you should think like middle school kind of level. We're not trying to be the next great math genius with this. It's more like a textbook for like a decent school that you might want to go to yourself. If you want to learn this stuff yourself, it doesn't hurt to start with something simple. You could call it a popularization if you want. And that's how it goes with the story on the virus. It's not like Fuller was uh, overlooked because he had these super uh, deep insights into virology per se, other than he was interested in a question a lot of people were caring about, which is, are these alive or, or not alive? We didn't want to call them dead, really because we don't talk about rocks as being dead, right? You sort of had to be alive for a while, and then you die, and after you die, you're dead. But to be dead from the beginning is not really the way we use English. So I wouldn't say these hacker robots, as one of the YouTube ladies was talking. Um, she was a scientist. I've watched a lot of the, you know, real virologists talk about what this stuff is about. They're not just teaching, right, Python, grammar, and sort of how to write a modern scientific paper. That's more what I'm into, right? So this is like generator expressions and the kinds of things that you might not ever need to know because in, in, in the specific form, right, we could be well beyond this particular uh, need, but I've learned a lot. The need to learn Python, for example, it might not be. It has a half-life. Computer languages do, right? So in that case, you know, this had a different spin back when it was more relevant. But you can still look at it as sort of a artifact of a certain sort of curriculum that was emerging in the Silicon Forest in the turn of the millennium era, right? And it had to do with phasing in quite a bit of this, what I call American transcendentalism, which has a pedigree, right? It traces back to Margaret Fuller and Emerson. and Probably we could throw in Whitman, but also, um, oh, what's his name? Swedenborg, right? We don't have to stick to the Americas or something. We can explore all that. But it's like a humanities uh, that was knocking on the door of STEM at one point and saying, hey, 
here's the Buckminster Fuller part of the story, but it's really um, only in the humanities that you would necessarily want to learn that. In other words, if you're studying to be a virologist, then it's probably not all that important that you ever learned about this attempt by the geodesic dome guy to like get some headlines out of it when he could predict some of the capsimere counts. But then Goldenberg's ty ty taxonomy and the way we break it out into class class one, class two, class three, a lot of this stuff which pertains to domes as well. Joe Clinton is a great authority on all this. Um, that doesn't have to be included in right a just sort of high school level American literature course. Maybe later we get into more of the architecture of um, geodesic domes and stuff. There's a lot of segues here, right? Obviously. Check out antiprism.com while you're at it. That compiles to a Raspberry Pi and you can generate all kinds of these kind of things directly in POV ray format, which you can then render, right? These are free open source tools. POV ray grew up on CompuServe is a very good ray tracer. And Antiprism, what I'm showing you here, is a utility for spitting out POV ray render ready files. You just um, generate them with command line switches could be on your Raspberry Pi and then you'll get a POV file this is one way to do it that you can then run through this other piece of software called POV, POV Ray which I run on a Mac and other things as well not sure why it's taking so long to load though very strange oh because I spelt it wrong again see what I do Spelling wrong. POV ray. Still takes its sweet time, but they're ray tracing software. Check it out. As of 2020, even though it's 25 years old, still classic and wonderful software that you can do so much more with than I have ever done. I use it mainly just to generate a lot of the graphics that you see floating around in my various. Uh, YouTubes, like here, right? That would have been a POV ray. This would have been, this might, yeah, this might be from, um, I think that one's from Richard Hawkins. He had a higher end graphics uh, computer than I did and contributed a lot of cool graphics when this website was first evolving in like the 1990s. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.